and welcome to Bessel Collective Church. Good morning. Uh, hello, Facebook and YouTube and whoever else might be listening, wherever you are. We're grateful that you were here with us. Uh, feel free to say hi in the comments um, to friends and new friends and strangers. Uh, I have a friend, Dara. She's playing keys for us this morning. So say hi to her and say hi to her newborn baby and say hi to her husband, Ben, and you know the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> So this, this week, we're going to start a new, um, we're continue our series, the coordinate series, and we're going to continue it with unity. And so our first song, um, Raise a Hallelujah, we really want to sing it together, even though we're not physically together, um, just to raise this praise to God um, as a church community, but also as the kingdom of God. And so as we sing this, uh, I just really want you to just feel it in your heart, like you're singing this with the angels and you're singing this with your friends and your family and people that are across the world. And so I'm going to pray and then we're going to get into worship. Um, God, I just thank you for this beautiful time. Uh, thank you for um, just the opportunity to get to worship with, um, with our church, um, with your church. Um, God, we just thank you for um, the power of unity and God, how you bring us together from all different walks of life. Um, from all different cultures and backgrounds, um, God, that we can all raise a hallelujah and a praise to you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies.
now you may be questioning why we worship this this man why he deserves our praise why he deserves our worship and if this is you it's okay to ask these questions we see it all through scripture we see it with King David in Psalms we ask these questions of God questions like this.
Our psalm reading for today is Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore.
Let your name be glorified. Let your name be glorified in this house and in every house that is praising you today, God. You are a generous giver. You're generous every day. Whether we see it or not, Lord, your mercies are daily. They are in us waking up with breath, Lord. You are merciful, and you are kind, and you are generous. And you love us beyond the way that we can even imagine the way you love us, Lord. You're a creator, and you're a generous giver, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Well, good morning, Vessel Collective Church, and welcome to Church at Home. First and foremost, thank you for being here, and thank you for being a part of our service this morning, wherever and however you are consuming and participating in our services. That's been a big thing for us throughout this Church at Home process, is that we don't want it to feel like you are a fly on the wall, or that you're watching Netflix or YouTube, but that you are an actual participant in this morning. So I want you to get ready with your fingers. I may ask you some questions and have you engage, and I wish I had prizes to give away, but I don't. But regardless, I would love for you to jump in and participate. So first and foremost, I want you to say good morning and welcome people that are here, uh, wherever and however you're watching. If you're on YouTube, say hello there. I believe there's a live chat. Uh, Facebook, there definitely is. Um, and just say good morning. Uh, that would be a big deal. And I don't care if you're here every week or if you are lurking and this is your first time here. Uh, when you come into the vessel on Sunday mornings, when we gather and where we gather at the YMCA, we have a sign that says you belong here. We truly, truly mean it. Is that I don't care where you come from, what your walk of life has been, um, what you think or believe or anything. We want you to belong. And we believe that the vessel is a place for you to belong. We see each other as family and we love each other dearly. And so consider this the portion of the service to where the pastor says, hey, turn around and greet someone next to you and say good morning and shake their hand, which uh, I don't know if that's ever going to come back in the same way as it was before. Uh, the second thing I want you to do is I would love for you to share our service. If you are in social media, there's a button at the bottom to click share. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, just copy this link and send it to someone. I don't care if you have a group chat with uh, gals in the neighborhood that you play Kino with, but please send that to them uh, as that would mean a lot. Um, because we believe in what the Lord's doing here. We believe in the message and the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we firmly stand our feet on here at the vessel. And, and there are people out there in your community that need to hear it and need to know how much Jesus loves them. It, I know it's small, but by you sharing that, you never know who is going to hear the good news of Christ today. And that would mean a ton for us. So, um, you know, as we are planning on, uh, the last thing I want to say before we jump in is, as we've been planning for the fall, I want to update you and let you know that we do have plans for returning to services uh, in the flesh on Sunday mornings at the Chasco Family YMCA. We sent a email out through our newsletter this week. If you don't get our newsletter in the chat box, we'll put a little link there that uh, you can click on and go to our, our uh, website, vessel.church, and you should be able to sign up for our newsletter and to get that information. And so we sent that out, but our plan is, and our current, um, what, we're, what we're preparing for is to come back for services on September 20th. Um, for those who are ready, and we're gonna be really patient and really delicate as we do that. And what we're really gonna to try to do is take take small steps towards safely gathering again. So the good news is, is that church at home is still gonna be of the highest priority. So if you're watching from another city or you are in the, the group that is um, maybe vulnerable right now health-wise um, and you're high risk, is that uh, church at home is still gonna continue. And, and so we're gonna be doing this. And so the the main thing is that everyone makes the right decision for their family. It's just like school. And my wife and I are trying to figure out with our own kids how to get them back in school, what that looks like, what the timeline looks like, what we're comfortable with. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's really about families making a decision that's best for them. So the same is true about church. And so I'm really excited about that. And as I was pre preparing for uh, this weekend's message, my mom sent me uh, the message last week from her church and her pastor was, was teaching out of Daniel chapter five. And he said something 
that was just really powerful and really spoke to my heart in this context. He said that um, he said that that God has never dwelled within the walls of a building, but God dwells in the hearts of His people, and that just because we may not be gathering on Sunday mornings right at this moment does not mean that God isn't here and does not mean that we're any less of a church than we were before. And if we're waiting for a building or a place to meet to be a church, then we've got it, we, we're, we've got it really backwards. And, I, and trust me, no one is more done with this than me, is that we are literally doing church out of our home. Um, every week we're recording a message. This is my bedroom that you're in right now. Uh, worship was recorded in our living room is that and as much of a blessing that it's been for us it's hard and it's a burden and so I'm so ready to be done but I want to encourage you towards endurance I want to encourage you towards faithfulness I want to encourage you towards the truth that God resides and dwells in the hearts of his people not in some sort of building with a steeple or white doors or whatever we think it is so that's my spiel as we get into it and speaking of our message this morning is on our core value of unity. If you've been here the last several weeks, we've been walking through our four core values here at The Vessel, and even beyond weeks. It's been uh, a couple months now that we've really tried to patiently walk through each value as well as our mission statement and, and understand biblically why those are important, not only for us as The Vessel and as a church, but why it's important for you and your relationship with Jesus Christ and how you follow Him and how you do that well and faithfully. So we have arrived at our last core value. We did the core value of authenticity. We did the core value of generosity. We did the core value of humility. And now here we are this Sunday, and this Sunday and next Sunday, as we wrap up this series uh, called Coordinates, we're gonna be talking about unity. And so before we dive into the word, I wanna give you a little bit of perspective of what I think about unity, because I have opinions. Um, and where I think we get it right, and more importantly, where I think we get it wrong. I think that unity, out of the four core values that we have here at the Vessel, unity is probably the one that we feel the most comfortable with and that we feel the most confident in. And so when you list those, humility, authenticity, generosity, and unity, if we had to, if we had to rank them out of our comfortability level and what we're most confident in, we get unity. We think, I know that gathering with other people is really important. I know that uh, following Jesus is meant to be done in the community of other people. I know that, um, yeah, that this is not a journey that is to be done alone. And so when we say unity, people are like, I get it. That's really good and that's really important. But I also want to give you a warning is that I think that unity is the one that we most, that's the one that's most misunderstood and the one that we probably look at and don't have the healthiest biblical view of. Because what we perceive as unity a lot of times, we think it means finding people that are like us, that, that look like us, that feel like us, that experience life the same as us, and surrounding ourselves with those people and getting along and singing kumbaya and having things in common. And we have the same opinions and we have the same values and we have the same perspectives and same experiences and that those people get us. And I want you to know that that is not unity. That's compatibility. That's a bubble. And what I think that if we seek that out and if that is our heart, I believe that that is, that is more division than it is unity. Because that's not the picture that Scripture paints. Scripture does not paint a bunch of people that get along all the time, that have the same opinions, that have the same thinking, and getting them into a room together so that everything is easy. And the mistake that we've made is that we've fallen into that rut. And so everything this morning, I want to push against that. And I want to make sure that we are speaking the same language. And when I say unity that you know what I mean. And when you say unity, I know what you mean. And what I don't mean is surrounding ourselves with people that are exactly like us and creating a Christian country club so that we can be comfortable and we can be happy and we can be um, with people that are just like us. I think that's divisive. 
I think that divides and doesn't unite. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to jump into uh, God's Word. So if you would, pray with me. Dear Lord, I thank you um, for the rain, God, and for um, just as I sit here now in my uh, bedroom, the rain that's outside. God, I thank you for unity. God, I pray for this morning as we open your word, Lord, would you speak powerfully to us? Would we get a clear picture and perspective of what kingdom unity looks like? God, would you help us to lay down baggage, to lay down expectations, to set down even our own desires that we could hear from you? God, would you silence my voice and amplify your own? And God, would you speak powerfully through your word? And I pray that right now where people are in their homes, Lord, that you invade that space. So wherever you are right now as we're praying, I just want to encourage you. Take a moment and invite God in. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to have all the words. Just invite him into your space right now. Lord, we welcome you here and we thank you for your presence pray these things in your name. Amen. So what we're going to be doing this morning is going to look a little bit different than what I typically do. A lot of times uh, as I, if you guys know my teaching, I love to get a passage of scripture and dive deep on it and, and to focus pretty much exclusively on one passage of scripture. And that's what this morning is going to look very different than that. Rather than choosing a singular scripture, we're going to be leapfrogging through scripture a little bit, but we are going to be in the same section of the Bible is that we're going to be focusing pretty much exclusively on uh, the epistles. So if you don't know what epistle is, epistle is a section of books in the New Testament that are letters that were written to the church uh, from the Lord uh, through typically Paul, but other people as well. Sorry, I'm having coffee here, here as well. Same as you, hopefully. But we're going to be looking at these epistles and uh, kind of jumping back and forth. And you're going to see, and the reason I'm... I think that that's important. That's why I felt like what we should do this morning is you're going to see this theme of unity again and again and again and again. And I want you to know that because we're talking about it, because we may struggle with it, because it may be an issue in the church as a whole today, I want you to know that we are in good company because we see this from the beginning and the birth of the early church, the New Testament church, is that again and 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 again the Lord talks about unity. And he paints this picture of unity being something that's really difficult, but that's worth fighting for. So that's what I want to encourage us to today. I want to encourage us to put down things that we think that it is and look towards the kingdom for what it truly is. And so we're going to leapfrog uh, through kind of the New Testament a little bit, but we're going to have kind of our key and our main verses up on the screen. Uh, and we'll put them in the little chat box. If you can't find them, you can look them up yourselves or the scripture will be there. So um, as we go through, I'm going to look at three things about how we're united biblically uh, and juxtapose that and put that against how uh, maybe we think that we're united incorrectly and in errors that we may have. And the first one is this, is that we're united by the spirit, not self. Is that unity is by the Spirit, not self. Ephesians 4, verse 2 and 3 says this. It says, Be completely humble, which is one of our other core values, and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And what Paul is encouraging the church in Ephesus uh, towards here is towards unity. And if you know that that first half of Ephesians chapter 4, he goes on and on and, and beautifully articulates and writes what it looks like and how we are united by the one. He said it's one faith, one baptism, one hope, one God and Father who is above all, through all, and in all. And he does a great job of painting this picture of the church in Ephesus that is obviously dealing with disunity and division, and to say that we're not united by our differences, that we're united by the one Christ that we serve, by the Spirit. And it's important that we take note here in verse 3 that Paul doesn't encourage them to create unity. He says, he doesn't say, make every effort to create unity of the Spirit. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. 
Church, we should take heart and we should take confidence knowing that unity isn't ours to create, but it is ours to maintain and it's ours to fight for. Um, you know, when we create unity out of self, what we end up doing is we create organizational unity. We create denominational unity. And I'm not saying uh, that denominations are bad or that organization is bad. Those can help serve the unity. But make no mistake, we don't create unity on ourselves, but we, we are called by the Lord to maintain that unity. You see, when we focus on self over spirit, when it comes to unity, what we do when we look at self and we focus on that is we begin to our, ask our questions, what is best for me? What, what, is, what is best for myself rather than for the greater good, rather, rather than for the spirit and for the, the sake of the body? And honestly, this is a reasonable response. In our brokenness, in our human flesh, the idea of, of preferring ourselves and, and, and seeking our self-preservation first, that is a really normal and appropriate response in our brokenness. But the Spirit says otherwise. The Spirit says otherwise. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. This goes against the grain of every fiber in our flesh, in our humanly flesh. And that's why, church, that we are called to be vessels. That's why we're vessel collective church, is that as a vessel of the Lord, of the living Christ, that we are to pour ourselves out. So all of that selfishness that's in us and all that self-preservation, that we are to empty that so that we can be filled by the Spirit of Christ. That's what it means to truly be a vessel. And the problem is, and what I think the major issue is, is that preferring self over spirit, it happens in subtle ways. It happens slowly over time. And I think that that is when it can become dangerous or destructive. And we, 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 we look up one day, and our unity is unity of self, not unity of the Spirit. You see, unity of the Spirit always prefers the kingdom over self. You see, the unity of the Spirit does this naturally. It, 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 is, it is a selfless act in and of itself to be unified by the Spirit. It's truly the story of the gospel. It's Jesus Christ going to the cross, laying down his own life for the sake of ours, that's what the Lord did. He chose us over himself. That we, who were owed a death on a cross, were paid that ransom by someone who didn't. The Lord who lived a sinless and perfect life, he is the one that, that, that deserved to have life everlasting, but he conquered death in our place and he chose us over him. So first and foremost, we're united by the Spirit and not self. And I think the key important thing here is that as I talked about it happening subtly over time, uh, not to worry us, but there's it gives us this, this pause of like, how do we know? How do we recognize that? If it's subtle and it's slow and it's over time, how do we recognize if and when that is happening? And we recognize it by the fruit, just like you would spot and recognize a tree outside. You know what type of tree it is by the fruit that it bears. And when we, when, we, when we bear fruit of the Spirit, we know that our unity is from the Spirit. In Galatians 5, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, forbearance, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such thing there is no law. So if you want to put your heart to the test, if you want to put your unity to the test, it's those things. It's do these things exist? And when it's divisive and it's hate and it's anger and it's these things that we see all around us in the world right now, that's not of the spirit, that's of self. You know, I had a really interesting conversation recently with somebody that I really love and admire. And they told me as we were having a conversation about the, the, the landscape of race relations and how broken it is and, and the racial injustice that we see going around us. 
and they confessed to me. They said, I need to tell you something. I need to confess something. They said, I'm racist, that I've been racist and I've done racist things in my life. And man, that was so powerful for this person to get to that place. And man, how many times have I heard over the course of the past six months, I'm not a racist. There's not a racist bone or fiber in my body and I'm not this and I'm not that. And Yeah, there's race out there. There's, there's racism out there and systemic racism, but not here and not me. That's the first person that told me, I think I'm racist. And for them to reflect that, for them to admit that, to confess that, I mean, that is powerful. That is powerful. And you look, and that is fruit of the Spirit. That's someone taking an honest look and allowing the Spirit to cleanse them and to wash over them and to set self aside for the sake of Spirit. And you may think, what a terrible person. Man, what a terrible person for them to be racist and to admit that. I mean, that is powerful. That is powerful. And so our true unity comes by the Spirit, not self. The second thing that we see here in the epistles um, is, that, is that unity comes by power, not preference. That we are united by power, not preference. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the very birth of the, the New Testament church, says this, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. The script, the, the biblical, the scripture really says they were all together in one accord, which is unity. Verse two, suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You know what I love about the early church in Acts, and I see there, is there's lots of ways, if you read through the book of Acts and the birth of the New Testament church, there's lots of words that you could use to describe. But one of the words that I think describes best uh, what Acts is about is the, and characterizes it best is the idea of togetherness. We see that here. It says that we are all together of one accord. That we see this again and again through Acts. It says they came together in their homes. It says they met together in the temple courts. It says they prayed together. They ate together. That God provided for them when they were together. That the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved when they were together. Is there's power in togetherness and there's power in unity. Um, in Acts chapter 4 verse 31, verse 31 it says that, that they came together in prayer and the earth shook. The ground beneath them shook. I think, man, that is power. That is power that is only from the Lord and can't be manufactured by man. Again, later on, they're praying for Peter who's been in prison. It says they begin to pray for him and the walls of the prison shook and crumbled because of the power of the Lord. It didn't say that when they went to their prayer closet or when they were in their quiet time alone with God that that's when the power was. It's that the power came in their togetherness but we don't see that as much now. I think that we see much more preference in church rather than power. And you, you can think about examples probably in your own life or something that you've heard, but um, we don't have to look very far to find a great example of that, and that is uh, worship. Is that there's so much preference when it comes to worship that nearly every week there's someone who is unhappy with worship because it doesn't meet their preferences. Either worship is too loud, or worship is too quiet, or worship is uh, too upbeat and too fast, or worship is too slow and too melancholy. Whether worship is too long, we've got too many songs we're singing, or worship isn't long enough, there's not enough songs. We're doing too many new songs, and I don't know these songs, or we've already done these songs, and they're old, and I'm bored with them, and worship is full of preference. And you want to take the Spirit of the Lord out of something real quick, then just start complaining about it. Just start complaining about this isn't good enough for me. This doesn't meet my preferences. This doesn't, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't make me happy. And to think, man, that we come together to worship a risen Savior and King 
and that we're coming to a place in one accord and united and in power, but yet we're focused on how it makes us feel. And we see that all too often in the church. And, and if you don't believe me, you can ask Sean or you can ask Gary or you can ask Jessica. We hear it again and again, preference when it comes to worship. And we see it on Sunday mornings as a guest, a new guest comes. As they, they ask the same questions every week. They're saying, how was the preaching? Did he do good enough? Was he prepared enough? Was he funny enough? Was he articulate enough? Was he um, whatever? And we see it in music. Did I like the music? Did it meet my preferences? And that's how they choose the church that they're going to be a part of. And I'm telling you, if that's you, you will always be left disappointed. That You're never going to play, find a place and find a building and find a group of people that does everything how you like to do it. You know, when we were at Robertson, uh, I used to hear... Uh, someone came and talked to me. They wanted to talk to me about something really serious. We were meeting in the cafeteria there, and they said, you know, I really don't like the yellow walls in the cafeteria. And I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. How are we going to change the walls? We can't repaint the cafeteria. But we see that all the time. We see preference over power. And uh, I used to be a middle school coach, and I saw it there as well, is that I learned really quickly that out of all the sets of parents in the stands and in the stadium, that there was typically only one set of parents that were happy at any given moment. And believe it or not, that was the parents whose kid had the ball in their hands. And even they weren't happy if the play didn't go well or their kid didn't score or it wasn't well. And the sad thing is, is we see that in the church. And so I'll confess something to you this morning. I'll confess it to you as we're here in the spirit of authenticity. As we sang that song this morning, This is Amazing Grace, uh, as part of our worship set. I don't like that song. I don't know if I'm tired of it. I don't know if it doesn't meet my preference, whatever it may be. But that's not my preference of song. And I, we do it all. We sing it. We sing it often. But as we were worshiping this week, we, like I said, we record uh, our worship here at my house. And I'm a part of it. And so they were leaning through that song and Corey and I were over there kind of doing the, the lyrics and the recording. And man, the spirit just moved powerfully in that song. And I was profoundly touched as our worship team led through that. Because the truth is, I don't care about my preferences. And as Jess led through that and said, man, these are the questions people ask about you. Like, this is amazing grace. God, who would take my place on the cross? I was profoundly touched and I'm like trying to be quiet and you can ask Jess and them. I know we're recording so I don't want to mess up. I'm in the background. I'm just like, yes, Lord, thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. You know, scripture in Philippians chapter two that says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value others above yourself. It continues on to say, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. The scripture takes it a step further. Not only are we supposed to set our preferences and our own desires down, but we're to look towards the preferences to others. And the truth is, is that we don't like church and we don't like it because we're consumers and not contributors. Because we're consumers and not contributors. You know, this last six months, Jessica and I have talked a ton about worship and about where race relations are in our world right now. And she, as a, as, a, as a black woman that's coming into our church to lead our church and to step into a place of leadership within our church to lead us in worship, we talked about what does that look like and how do we do that well? And how do we celebrate diversity? Because here's what I believe. I believe that diversity is at the heart of unity that if you look around and you don't have unity within your church, I believe you don't have, I mean, excuse me, if you don't have diversity within your church, I don't believe that you have unity. I believe that, that diversity is at the heart of unity. And it's not just about uh, people that look different, that have, that have come from different places, but it's about, it's about experience and how we worship. And Jess has said what it looks like to come. Like She's from this, this uh, Pentecostal background of church that loves gospel music. And if you know me and I have my preference, we're doing gospel every week because I love gospel music. And so, but Jess says that one of the really rich things is that when, we, when someone comes into our body that's from a different place or has had a different perspective or experience, 
that it's important that they bring in their cultures and they bring in their preferences and they bring in their influence as well. It's not saying, hey, we want to be a diverse church, so we're gonna, we, we want Jessica to come in and lead our worship, but we want to continue with our white Christian cultured church. We don't have to look this way. No, diversity brings richness into our church, and it brings richness into the body. And I believe that diversity is at the heart of unity. And the last is this, is the, the, the first being is that unity is by the Spirit and not self, that unity is by power and not preference. But finally, as we close, unity and we are united by Jesus and not Jake. That we are united by Jesus and not Jake. And you can change Jake for whatever man that you may be following. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And if you know me, I love the church in Corinth because if I look at the things that we struggle with, the vessel, the problems that we may have, or the difficulty, if I need just some comfort, I can look to the church in Corinth because they had all kind of issues. And one of them was obviously diversity. I mean, not diversity, unity. And they weren't united over certain things. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes this. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And I love this, that Paul doesn't mince words here. He goes directly at it. He could not be more clear. He doesn't want there to be any confusion uh, to the church what he's talking about and the importance of unity. He says, I want you to be uh, united in everything no division among you. Be perfectly uh, united in mind and thought. Scripture tells us that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. It doesn't mean that they all think the same thing at the same time, but it's that their minds are being transformed into the mind of Christ and that there's no division. They're perfectly united. And it reminds me of my son Keller. And so I, I will tell Keller to do something and he is a bit ADD like me. And so I understand where he comes from. And I'll tell him, I'll say, Keller, I want you to do these three things. I want you to repeat it back to me. I don't want you to be confused or not understand clearly what I'm asking you to do. So if I tell him to be getting ready for bed, I said, I want you to go upstairs. I want you to get your pajamas on. I want you to brush your teeth. I want you to read in bed and I'll be up there. And I'm like, repeat it back to me, buddy. Because like Paul, I don't want him to have any confusion of what I'm speaking about. And that's what Paul is saying here. So I think for us to consider, are we united in Jesus Christ? Are we united by, our, by a man, by some person, some fleshly person that we're, we're following? It's worth considering these questions, asking ourselves, what is it that we're talking about? What is our issue that we have? And, and he says here, he says, these quarrels among you. And let me tell you, if there are quarrels among the church, within the church, there may be an issue of disunity. And there may be an issue of us uniting behind a person rather than a savior. And it happens in marriage. I think about Shay and I. Uh, we will get, we'll start an argument or we'll be fussing at one another about something. And then we'll, we'll have some sort of quarrel between us. And we'll get down the road and I'll think, I don't even remember what we're fighting for. I don't even remember what we're arguing about. We're just disunified. And the same thing that can happen in the church. And this seems like a simple idea, but this has been an issue with the church since the birth of the church. And I want you to know, if you are following a man, you will be disappointed. If we are united behind me or some other pastor or some other person or some other group of men and we're not united in Christ, we're going to be disappointed and it's going to create problems. I want you to know that the vessel is not my church. It's not mine. It is your church. It is your church as much as it is mine. 
and that we are united here because Christ has called us together, not because of our preferences, not because of uh, that we came up with some really clever plan about how to have a church, but we're united by Jesus Christ and by his blood. And the truth is, if you are united by a person, sooner or later, you will fall. In this scripture here, it talks about division. It said, let there be no divisions among you. The word division here, biblically, uh, is the word schismata. And what it really means is to tear apart or to have a gap. And this is the same idea in divorce. This is why divorce is so painful, is that when two people get divorced and they're torn apart, it's painful. There's no clean way to do it. There's no way to go through that that doesn't leave damage. And it's hurtful. And I think about when we as the vessel left ACF, that was really the thing that stuck with us and, and, and really the reason why ACF sent us out is that they came and they realized there was no division within the body. There was no schismata. There was no tearing or gaps within our body of Christ. And so they felt like the right thing to do was to send us out and to not create that division within us. So I want you to know, church, that we are united by Christ and not by a man. So as we close this morning, I want to give you a few points of application. These are just things that you can do today. And it doesn't matter if you are part of the vessel or you're watching from Timbuktu. Uh, There are things that are really important things you can do today. The first thing, the first application point is you can sharpen the knife. You can sharpen the knife. Scripture says that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Um, recently Shay and I got a knife sharpener. I know that's silly, but our knives got so dull in our drawer that, I mean, they couldn't even cut a piece of fruit. They were so bad. And so I went online and I looked and I researched and I got a really good knife sharpener. We got a knife sharpener. And so we sharpened our knives and man, it's like they're brand new and they cut through anything now. We can cut tomatoes, whatever it is. But the truth is, is that when you sharpen a knife, you take something away. That sharpening remove something from the blade of the knife to make it sharper. And I want to encourage you to give freedom to people in your life to sharpen you. If you don't want to be dull, and if you want to be a knife and a tool that is effective and that is useful, you've got to allow people into your life to sharpen you, to tell you hard things, to challenge you on stuff, to keep you accountable to the Lord. And it will be hard And you will have to take things away. You will have to get permission for people to say, man, I'm not so sure about that. Or I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you to pray about that. Whatever it may be. But if we truly want unity, if we want kingdom, biblical, spirit-focused, Jesus-focused, power-focused unity, we've got to allow ourselves to be sharpened. The second thing is this, is to try something new because it might taste good. This is something that we say often in our household. It's from a Daniel Tiger episode many years ago. Many years ago, if you have kids or preschoolers, you know um, what I'm talking about. But there's this whole episode out about trying new foods, and he sings this song: "You got to try something new because it might taste good." And so we tell that to our kids often, um, and we still use it to this day. And so uh, I want to tell you, church, that you got to try something new because it might taste good, that there are things that are outside of your preferences or your desires, but you don't know it until you try it. You don't know if you'll like it until you taste it. And so I want to encourage you of that. I've been doing this discipleship group with this pastor out of San Antonio, and he, one of the weeks he did this cross diagram with us, and he it's like this picture and he drew out and it was like sin. It was like us and God and sin was in the middle and this gap and there the cross came down and I hated it. I hated it. It's just way too formulaic. I was just like, oh, this isn't me. But he challenged us to share that with someone that week. And I will be honest, I didn't want to. But I thought, you know what? I, I'm in this class. He's been a pastor for 25 years. I've been a pastor for two and a half months. Not really, but you know. He knows a lot more than me. I've, I've got to try something new. And so I reached out to a neighbor and I showed him this and I shared the gospel with him for the first time. He had never heard the gospel until I sat down and did that with him. And so I want to encourage you, you got to try something new because it might taste good. Uh, the last application is to let it go. 
The last thing I want to say as we finish up this morning is to let it go. Is that we are still holding on to offenses towards one another. We're still holding on to things that happened, transgressions against us, and we're still holding that against people. And, and I was described this recently. That it was, it was uh, done like this. I'll use this little toy here. Is that as long as we're holding something against someone, if we're, if we're holding an offense against someone, we've got to put pressure on them. And as long as we're holding this against them, this offense, this transgression, that we're always going to be pushing them in the other way. But it's not until we let go and we let go of that offense that it falls that we can restore relationship. There are many of you out there right now that are holding something against someone. You have to let it go. You've got to let it go. We are broken people that serve a perfect Savior. And we've got to begin to see each other how Christ does. And I've experienced this in church. There's been people that have gotten offended or gotten mad over something we did or didn't do and have left the church only to never hear from them again. And it breaks my heart. And I mean, there's even been times where I've reached out to people and just gotten crickets back. And I want you to encourage you to let the Lord heal what has been torn. If there's been a severed of a relationship, or there's been a tearing or division, schismata, as scripture puts it, that you've got to allow the Lord to heal it. We are broken people. And every one of us has those times and those examples. And to make an effort to let that thing go. Let me pray for us and we're going to go. Dear Lord, I love you and I thank you so much for unity. She said, thank you that you call us together, to be together of one accord by your spirit. God, that when we gather, there is power. When we're united by you, Jesus, there's power in that earth-shaking, chain-breaking power. And God, I thank you that we are united behind a perfect and holy Savior, not some man. Jesus, help us to let go of following a man. God, help us to let go of our preferences. And Jesus, help us to let go of ourselves so we can truly be united in you. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in your name. Amen.